Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Crystal Collins Judd, the president here at Sarah Lawrence, and it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, you to tonight. Um, a, a great evening ahead of us. Uh, as many of you know, we're spending this year focused on the theme democracy and education, and as we ha are really digging into that theme, what that means, the relationship between the two, we're privileged to have a number of um, guest speakers, panels, events across this year. And so I'm grateful to Merrick Fuchs, who is the Ellen King, yeah, who has a fan club, um, right, a fan club, um, and the Ellen Kingsley Hirschfeld Chair, uh, which is sponsoring tonight's lecture, um, and uh, to Merrick for bringing to us uh, Jeff Fager. And we are so pleased to have Jeff here. I talked to him just before I came up on stage and said, I can do the really long version of all of the many accolades for your life, or I can do the brief introduction and let us get to what we're excited about, which is hearing you. And we agreed that I would do the brief one. Um, one of the things you'll notice outside is the book, 50 Years of 60 Minutes, and that begins to tell you the story. Um, Jeff has been at CBS News for 35 years uh, with experience at every stage um, of the uh, electronic news business and of the media with 21 years as an executive producer, 13 of those at the helm of 60 Minutes. Um, and he began his 14th season as the executive producer of 60 Minutes in the fall of 2017 in the 50th season. So as we invite Jeff to share a conversation with us and to share his thoughts, uh, and we will have Q&A afterwards, the importance of media and the kind of work that 60 Minutes has done and continues to do as we think about what a free press means, what we think about democracy and education means, um, uh, makes it a particularly timely conversation for us to have you here in this 50th season of 60 Minutes. So, Jeff Fager. Thanks, Alan. That was, that was nice and short. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be at Sarah Lawrence. What a beautiful place this is. Uh, my sister lives in Bronxville, so I've been coming here for a long time. And uh, I work with Merrick's cousin, who I'm going to talk about because she's actually a, a huge part of 60 Minutes, and she's a big part of what makes us different. And uh, I want to talk about that as well in terms of the sort of conventional wisdom, particularly in broadcast journalism today and how we go against it, uh, and yet we are the most successful news program in America by far. Uh, first, just a couple of things that happened, one thing in particular that happened this week that I want to talk about a little bit that is really significant, which is that YouTube took down the videos, or is starting to, of Alawaki. Uh, the cleric, the American cleric from who moved to Yemen was taken out by a drone strike, but who lives on as a martyr and uh, convinces young Americans to uh, go to war with, for the jihad and kill Americans. Uh, it's significant because I think that in social media in particular, we have a serious problem in this country right now. And uh, we hear a lot the phrase fake news. And usually it's the president saying fake news, and he's saying it about stories that he doesn't like. But they're not, it's not fake news that he's referring to. Real fake news is a serious problem in America. And it's being, it's being passed from person to person, mostly in Facebook. And when I think about the bad stories that are passed between friends who believe in similar things, and believe in similar issues, and share those thoughts and feelings, and then they share with each other a story that is negative towards a candidate, is negative towards a cause, is negative and fake about any number of things, not just for political positions, but for money, because so much of it is done by commercial interests, that there's something wrong with that. And if you said to me at 60 Minutes, well, you can put Alawaki on, just let him play as long as he wants. Well, no, we're not going to do that. Because we use our editorial judgment about what is right and not right to put out to a public of 14 million viewers every single Sunday night. 
And the same goes for fake news. And here's the st statistic that really matters. We did a serious report about fake news post-election to discover that more than 50% of the news consumed by people in the state of Michigan was fake. More than 50%, and most of it on Facebook. So the Facebook um, you know, CEO, you hear from them a lot when there's marketing, when there's a chance to sell something, but you don't hear from them and they won't come on 60 Minutes when there's something touchy like this, but they need to do something. They need to do something about misinformation being passed from person to person who is basically are their customers. Uh, I care about this because for, I think we all need to care about this, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's being used in ways, the phrase fake news, that just doesn't address the real problem. And uh, it so goes against what we stand for. And I want to tell a little bit of the story about 60 Minutes because uh, it goes way back to the very origins of CBS News. And that's with Edward R. Murrow and Fred Friendly. Murrow started our organization covering World War II from London. There was no CBS News before that. He was sent over there to work for CBS Radio and come up with content. Not necessarily or even considering there might be news content. Well, he turned that into a gathering of some of the finest correspondents that ever reported on the radio in a matter of a couple of years. People with names like Charles Collingwood, and Eric Severide and William Shirer split up around Europe to cover World War II. And they did an amazing job. And in the process, he built a system of values and standards that became the basis for CBS News. How, how stories should be told, how, how they should be told in specific ways, never overstating, always understating, always looking for something narrow to focus on, descriptive yet not filled with adjectives and adverbs, simple storytelling but incredibly well written, which is where Merrick comes in. <laughs> I tell kids all the time, whatever you do in college, if you want to be a journalist, learn how to write. I love that there's a writing discipline here and that it's, that it's in his tent because there are so few Americans who write well. And it's amazing. I hope it's getting better. But I learned to write in college, thank God. It's much more important to write in television than people think. And a lot of people come to us who are communications majors and they don't know how to tell a story. And ours is all about storytelling. And I'm going to get to why that's the most important part of 60 Minutes and the CBS News tradition. Murrow then came back to New York. CBS News was born, and Fred Friendly was the producer in charge, basically. And together they formed this organization that really only cared about the radio. Television was this uh, gadget. And there's nothing really comparable, I suppose. The internet is comparable if you go back to 2002, maybe 2000, compared to then radio and television. Uh, People had no idea how big it would become. And Don Hewitt, who created 60 Minutes, joined CBS News at that time, post-war. And he wasn't that excited about reporting. He was excited about lights and action. He was a bit of a showman. And they let him have television. Do whatever you want in television. And he, in the process of doing that, watched them and learned from them and became a television director and slowly but surely as the 50s arrived, uh, television started to take hold a bit and Murrow was doing television documentaries. Don, meanwhile, was growing as a director, not really as an editor, and directed the first debates between, Link, between uh, Kennedy and Nixon which was a significant moment. It was uh, 1960, and Nixon showed up without any makeup, and he had a five o'clock shadow, he hadn't shaved. He looked like hell. And Don said to him, you know, you might want to put some makeup on. 
And Nixon said, I don't want any makeup. And of course, the tan senator from Massachusetts looked like a million bucks, you know, fresh from Palm Beach after three days. And what's interesting about that debate is that the radio debate by the polling showed Nixon won. And the television debate, Kennedy won. And that was a turning point for television. And everybody realized, this is it. We've got to be really be turning our attention to it. So by 1963, they turned the Walter Cronkite CBS Evening News into a half hour long. And they made Don Hewitt the executive producer. And within about a year to two years, Fred Friendly became president of CBS News, which now had its flagship broadcast, the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. And one of the first things he did was fire Don Hewitt. He thought he was too much of a showman, not enough of a journalist to be in charge of that flagship broadcast. He fired him. And Don was shocked. He put him in charge of some uh, unit to make documentaries, which was just not in his chemistry at all. So he went about doing it. He called them hour-long snoozers. He decided that his attention span was what the normal attention span was, about 15 minutes. Why don't we create a broadcast with three little documentaries in it? And it can be high Murrow and low Murrow, because Murrow had two different shows. He had See It Now, and he, and he had a show called Person to Person, which was, See It Now was documentaries, serious interviews, Person to Person was more celebrity driven. And his idea was Life Magazine on television. Why not put it all in one hour? He couldn't get anybody to do it. And finally, Fred Friendly, who said, no way we're doing that, quit. And a guy named Dick Salant, who became president for 16 years, took over. Don convinced him, and 60 Minutes was born. And that uh, was the beginning. And it was a crazy beginning, because he came up with this idea really at the sort of in the depths of his career. He, he, he had risen to the highest point and he was at the lowest point. And what's interesting and important about it for us today is that Don Hewitt spent the rest of his career trying to prove to those Murrow boys, the gentlemen correspondents who were so smart and so together that he respected so much that he understood what they stood for. And he pounded it into us relentlessly for the next 35 years. I took over from Don. So what's amazing about 60 Minutes really is that two people have run it. And our values and standards go back to those first values and standards of CBS News. And we haven't changed them. We've changed a lot of things. And one thing I changed when I took over was to make it more newsy, more relevant more current, uh, fewer stories that could last for a long time. But so much of what we do hasn't changed. And it's why I refer to Claudia, Merrick's cousin. I hired her when we started our spin-off 60 Minutes 2 and I was put in charge of it. And because she, there's one person on our staff who looks at every single transcript that's ever spoken on tape, and that's Claudia, to, to determine did we leave something of some of the meaning out of what we ended up with our final cut? And she challenges every single producer and correspondent in every screening we have based on the transcripts about fairness and accuracy. That doesn't exist in any other broadcast journalism home. It's just us. And she's relentless, she's hardworking, she's diligent, and it's, separ it's one of the many things that separates us. And I want to talk about another one that was one of the things I learned from Don Hewitt that really goes against the conventions of today. We never, ever do audience research to decide what stories to cover. That's huge. Not only do people do audience research to find out what the audience wants them to cover, they, and this is across the board, look at ratings minute by minute to determine if the subject they're covering is not going to rate. And that's the word that's used. Is it going to rate? So <clears throat> the reason that's important and gets back to the storytelling part 
is that we don't seek out what our viewers want us to cover and what we think they will tune in to see. Instead, the onus is on us to make it so interesting, so compelling, that they have to watch. They just can't turn away. And that requires sto great storytelling. We focus on phrases, we focus on words, we focus on sentences, we write. As someone said, there's no such thing good thing as, there's no such thing as good writing, there's only good rewriting. And we do it over and over again until we get a story that's right and we feel it's, it belongs on the air. And I think when you watch 60 Minutes, that's a consistent, I hope, quality, is that each story you see feels like it belongs there. So, it's important that we, we make a point of avoiding those things, and I think that you know, what it proves is that there's a hunger in America for real reporting. I mean, a big hunger for it. And our goal is to help people better understand the stories, the big stories in the world. My favorite compliment, it comes on Monday, when someone says, I didn't think I was going to be interested in that, and you sucked me right in. So that's a significant difference from the way it works elsewhere. And, you know, the incredible, my favorite measure of what we do is called the nielsen Cume. While we don't do research in terms of what stories to cover, we do, we follow the ratings carefully because as long as we're doing well, we know we can do good. The nielsen Cume is put together every year by Nielsen and it, it, it actually measures every unique viewer on every television show. Someone who at least watched the program once. And the nielsen Cume for the past 10 years, we've been the most watched show in America with 120 million people watching it every year. I mean, that's an astonishing figure. Traditional television, seven o'clock on Sunday. You have to make an appointment. And I want to talk for a little bit about the future of that in terms of our digital footprint. But to me, it's, it's such proof that uh, you don't, you can cover what's important and you can tell it in an interesting way and Americans care about it. And that fits in with that old value which is don't ever talk down to the audience. Don't underestimate their knowledge. But appreciate that you know more about a story than they do. So, as we uh, enter this, uh, I think, phase where news becomes unreliable because it's not edited, because it doesn't go through that vetting, because anybody can write a blog which can be good and can be bad. And as news is unreliable, I think more and more people tune in for what they really want to see uh, that they can trust. And that, to me, that's a trend. That's, I'm optimistic about news organizations in America. I'm worried about local newspapers because I think they are in trouble. But the Washington Post, the New York Times, 60 Minutes, we're thriving. Particularly the Washington Post, which now has a very wealthy owner. Uh, just a little bit more about our history because um, you know, some of you probably don't know a lot of the characters that built it. Don Hewitt hired uh, uh, Harry Reasoner to anchor the first 60 Minutes, and he was talked into hiring Mike Wallace to join him. And Mike Wallace was an amazing character. He was a rascal at every level, on the air and off the air. And he used to be uh, constantly in everybody's face, on the air and off the air. And I, I tell a story about Mike when he, does, anybody, does everybody here know who Mike Wallace is? <clears throat> I'm, I'm starting to feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> Working around these sort of giants of journalism was one of the great experiences and I write about it in the book. But I tell a story about Mike because it says it all. He went into my friend Josh Howard's office and he said I want to do a story about Willie Nelson. He said, that's what Josh thought he said. 
He said, sure, I'll, I'll, that's fine, Mike. I'll, I'll start working on it right away. But, you know, I'm curious. We always do hard stories together. Why would you want to do a story about Willie Nelson? And Mike said, Willie Nelson? I said, Winnie and Nelson, as in Mandela. <laughs> Heard of him? And then my favorite line, excuse me, I didn't realize I had just wandered into the toy department. Um, that's the way Mike Wallace was. It, it's a tough place and it's a fun place and he was fun and he was tough. But it still is, I think, a challenging, difficult place to do well. And I think it should be. Uh, because that discipline that we follow uh, to get our broadcast on the air every single week, I think makes it better. And what's, it, what's exciting about it for me is the young journalists and, and, and people who are just coming out of college or in some cases grad school want to be at 60 Minutes and we have a, a huge amount of our staff under 30 and they're proud to be part of it. And being proud of what we do uh, I think is a big part of what drives us. So here we are celebrating 50 years and um, I brought a tape and this tape uh, is the opening to our 50 50th anniversary special, which is going to air on December 3rd. Um, and it's, it's not something we've put out. I've showed it a couple of times. But it's just the very first two and a half minutes introducing the program. So if you're ready to roll it, that'd be great. <clears throat> Thanks. You know, I, I look at that and realize how uh, lucky we are to be journalists. We cover the world. We uh, go to amazing places. Um, sometimes pinch ourselves that we're getting paid to do it. Um, but at the same time, we're all, I think, driven almost as if it's a calling, and that sounds a little sappy, but I think it's true, to cover what's important. And I think this fall, our 50th season is an example, a really good example of how we can do that. And the best of this fall has been the story we did on, on the opioid uh, epidemic and how the DEA is being hobbled in cracking down on illicit sales of opioids. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw that, but it, it made a big mark uh, and actually it was a powerful impact in how it was received and uh, there are hearings scheduled, there have already been people who have had to resign because of it and uh, really a remarkable piece of reporting by 60 Minutes and the Washington Post in collaboration. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that uh, we strive for. We try to get to the truth, we try to expose the truth when someone doesn't want it exposed. In this case it was a piece of legislation driven by the drug lobby to get the DEA to stop cracking down at a time when more Americans were dying from drug abuse and from overdose than any other drug crisis in the history of our country. It was an outrage. And I think when people saw it, they were outraged and uh, things started to happen right away. And in journalism, that's what you hope for. You hope to have an impact. Sometimes you have an impact on an individual who sees a story and is inspired by it or moved by it or wants to do something about it. And sometimes you do a story that has impact on the greater good, which was that opioid story. Uh, and so I think that uh, a couple of things. One, in terms of our future uh, and the future of journalism, I really do feel good about it in the sense that uh, we play so well as a story on your mobile device. If you just want to see a story, and that's part of the genius of Don Hewitt, how did he know? The TED Talk is 17 minutes long for a reason. The 60 minutes piece is 14, 15 minutes long. And if you want to watch it, while you're waiting for a plane or when you're commuting or when, anything, any moment that you have to watch a 15. That's why I'm optimistic about our future because it works. Video works. The newspapers are having a tougher time though they're starting to figure it out. I'm now a complete convert reading my newspapers on my iPad. And 
you know, that was a long time coming, it seems, but before we know it, the print versions are probably not going to be there to the dismay of a lot of people. They just cost too much money. Sorry, you're in print journalism. <laughs> and, uh, but, I, but I am optimistic about the news business. Be, for the same reason, I think quality finds a way. And quality finds an audience. And there isn't much of it, there isn't enough of it out there. Uh, and I, I think about it today, everything that we do. We don't have competitors. We do not have competitors on prime time. You just think about the kinds of stories that you see us doing. We're doing this week, we're probably going to do, we're going to lead on Sunday with a story about Yemen and how Saudi Arabia is shutting it off and causing possibly one of the worst famines in history. Uh, we, we might put along with that a story about North Korea and an American scientist who was invited over multiple times to see every part of their nuclear program. Uh, and every single week we do stories that defy conventional wisdom. And just to double back a little bit on the business about audience research, that research is done by focus groups. And almost all of the focus groups that get done by TV news organizations are in Las Vegas. Now, no offense to Las Vegas, but that doesn't really seem like average America to me. And they ask questions like, would you rather you see a story about the gasoline prices at your local gas station or a story about the war in Afghanistan? And most people are going to answer the gas station prices. But we don't do stories about the war in Afghanistan. We do stories about Americans fighting next to their brother about the enemy, about, about strategy, about the generals in charge, about the future of it. We do specific stories. We tell stories. And I, I promise you that if most people, and of any age group, because we don't pander to age groups either, that's another one of our values. I want stories, we all want stories that every age group is going to want to see. But. I know that several news organizations, including our, our own, uh, considered Afghanistan at a certain point in time to be a turnoff to viewers. And that, to me, is, goes against everything we stand for as journalists. Our job is to cover what's important and to help people better understand the important stories of our time. So, so far it's working. And, you know, the only thing that scares me about the future of 60 Minutes and other organizations like it is that it's more fragile than people realize. You know, we are blessed with uh, people who run CBS Corporation, beginning with Les Moonves, who are proud of 60 Minutes and appreciate what we do. We have huge budgets for our story that have never been cut. And we have never been told, I've never been told by him or anybody else in the corporation, why did you do that? And they catch hell. When we take on the drug lobby, they hear about it, because those are our biggest advertisers. But it doesn't keep us from doing tough stories, and our company supports it. Someone buys CBS who doesn't really want to be involved in that kind of stuff, that's what I worry about. That's why it's fragile. Because some, they could all of a sudden start calling me and saying, you know, that 18 to 49 demographic probably could be a little higher if he did more stories about this or that. And then it's over. And that's a slippery slope. And I've seen more and more solid places do that and move in that direction. And, um, you know, I just, I think that we're fortunate that we have what we have and, I, and, I, and we prove it every single week uh, with an incredible uh, size audience still. So, that's it. Anybody, uh, I'd love to take some questions uh, from anybody who has them. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, um, I know that like, you know, the world is changing and there's a lot of like pretty terrible stuff going on in the world right now. Yeah. Um, and there are people spearheading these movements and I understand that um, it's important to hear what they have to say, but how do you and how does your program um, talk to people who might have really, really extreme views and how do you approach that with an unbiased view? Yeah, that's a really good question. There are certain, look, we aren't the broadcast of record. 
And so we can pick and choose our stories as we wish. Uh, the New York Times is different. That is the newspaper of record, uh, and they really have to cover everything. But someone who's way out on the extreme and is trying to get attention, I don't want to put them on 60 Minutes. And, and I have that ability. And I think that's important. It gets a little, it's different when you're talking about a big social media platform or a major newspaper. Uh, but at the same time, this is part of what I was talking about at the beginning, which is that people have to make decisions about what's appropriate and what isn't. And I don't think personal bias gets into that. And by the way, if someone has a bias who works with us, they don't stay with us. Because you can spot it from a mile away, and so can the viewer, by the way. So I don't, um, you know, sometimes uh, it's not that complicated. And um, if someone like Al Wacky wants to put his videos on 60 Minutes, he's not going to get to. And that's ex as extreme as it gets, but there are a lot of elements in the, in the United States that get pretty extreme too. And, and uh, in, for instance, we put some extreme folks on in our story about fake news to hear from them. And um, that was important, but it wasn't a story about each of those individuals. It was to hear from where, where they were coming from and why they were distributing news that they knew might not necessarily be true. I have two questions. One is, uh, how do you decide which reporter takes on what story? And also, going into all of these horrible situations, um, how, how does your corporation, your the executives, or whoever is in charge, deal with secondary traumas? You know, yeah. The reporters come back. I yeah. can't imagine what they must be dealing with. It's such a good question. We, I think about it a lot because I spent a lot of my young career in conflict zones and I know that we have people working for us who are suffering PTSD and um, you know we take it very seriously. Um, we never tell someone to go into a conflict zone. That's always their idea. In terms of correspondence, it sort of is a similar situation. Uh, we want people to work on stories that they want to work on. So. We will assign stories from time to time, probably a third of them, but most stories on 60 Minutes are generated by everybody who works there, on and off the air. And if someone wants to go cover a conflict, a specific angle within a conflict, we are currently sending a team tomorrow to Kabul, Afghanistan, to do a story about Kabul, Afghanistan. It's incredible. It's a place we've been fighting for 15 years. The U.S. no longer, and please keep this quiet because we, we get, <laughs> can I have your trust? <laughs> we get scooped on this one, but it's a pretty good story. The U.S. no longer uh, drives people from the airport to the mission. We, uh, Ten miles away, we, they fly them. It's too dangerous to drive. I mean, that's a frightening thought. So we go in with, with serious security. It doesn't mean we haven't had issues and problems, and we lost a cameraman and a sound man in Iraq. And that was horrible for our organization. Um, but we always go in with, with bigger security than we ever did before because the press was never a target. You know, Morley Safer used to talk about how Vietnam was nothing compared to Iraq and Afghanistan. They, didn't, they, were, they were worried they'd get caught in a firefight but not be targeted. And our people are targeted. We no longer put press on our shirts. So, um, many college students don't own a television. Uh, we have access to them on campus. But you mentioned YouTube earlier. And I'd like to present a different point. Uh, how to, I just looked up your YouTube channel, and it has a little over 100,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. But I, I look at you know channels like uh, The Late Night with Stephen Colbert, mm -hmm. uh, and that's different, but it still has you know, millions. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, as an executive producer, want to go about um, addressing this futuristic uh, way of getting out information, because that's what a lot of us uh, use, you know, we go watch news on YouTube or other streaming services. Right. Want to address this problem. Well, we, um, the problem with YouTube for us is that there's no financial benefit, and by the way, Stephen Colbert's on our network, so uh, it's part of the same company. We, there's a certain degree of get it out there and let people see it, because then they're going to come see it on the network or on CBS All Access, which is our digital platform for everything we put on television. Um, our app has gone through a difficult period, our 60 Minutes app, 
And I want it to be easier to access for everybody and so that you can watch every one of our stories that we've digitized, which is now almost a third of the 5,000 that we've done, um, to make it easier for you to get. And maybe you pay a little fee to go with it. Or maybe we have a sponsor that shows a 10 second billboard that you can tolerate. Um, but that's how. I think YouTube, you know, and the only reason I'm critical of YouTube is because of this idea that anybody can post there and they're not watching it. They're making a fortune. Watch it more carefully. And, you know, uh, but, I, but, you know, we're thinking about it a lot and the company that I work for is in a different position because we don't have a lot of cable. So we have the ability, CBS, to have a digital platform and CBS All Access is what it's called and it's a big priority for the company. So that if you want CBS content, you have to pay $5 a month but you won't see commercials and you'll get everything you want. Um, I'm not sure that that's the answer and maybe there is a third party where we distribute our material. I guess what I'm saying is where, however it's distributed, and the future is not here yet, uh, it's, I, I'm confident it's going to work well. Um, you know, <clears throat> speaking of television, I'm wondering how does television and, you know, its visual aspect affect the way that um, people take in information, you know, rather than print or even radio? And, you know, in what ways is it a better or worse medium? Well, I think it's a worse medium because it's not as comprehensive. But you run into the same problem when you're writing a story for the newspaper, which is that you're limited and you have to make choices. And the choices that we make is really what I can't stand is when you see a sort of what we call a survey piece that kind of scratches the surface for 10 minutes, you know, and, and covers everything there is on an issue. We tell a story that is about a very narrow path. You know, we could tell a story about the opioid problem in America, but we told a story about the DEA being hobbled and cracking down on it. Uh, and if you look at 60 Minutes, that's how most of our stories work, so that we are able to dig down deeper because we're not trying to take on too much. And what I find interesting about it as a viewer is that you get to see, you get to take in more uh, than, than you would otherwise because in most television broadcasts, news broadcasts, because it's deeper. And I think that newspapers um, don't always follow that discipline well and tend to try to cover too much of a story. Um, so I think that's an issue of, for journalism. We are really well disciplined in doing that. And the other thing between print and television when television is good is the power of television. You know, it's amazing. <clears throat> I write about it in the book, and I think the example I use is uh, Arthur Miller uh, doing an interview with Mike Wallace. I mean, to hear Arthur Miller, you know, who wrote Death of a Salesman, talk about writing that in two days, you know, the first act. And then to hear him talk about Marilyn Monroe and what it was like to be married to her and to have Mike say, your face changes when you talk about her. You know, that doesn't work on, in print. Um, so there are a number of examples like that where the power of television when it, when it does really well um, can, can really be more effective and have more impact. The Washington Post in their collaboration with us on the opioid story was blown away by the uh, amount of impact it had. We added 13 million viewers to their one million. But again, it was because of television that it resonated more. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one is that you've mentioned in all, previously, but also in the show itself, that you don't rely and try not to interview experts, that you in the stories are the experts. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. as far as um, just also from a writer's standpoint, mm -hmm. especially when you're um, a little nervous about relying on oneself to be right. the expert when you think that you should be going to those people. Um, my second question is you also mentioned the writing, um, and I'm a writer, but I also um, remember how big Bob Simon and Morley Safer were in their writing um, as far as for the program itself and how that writing is so impactful along with the visuals of the show. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, 
the first part of it, remind me. Oh, yeah. So you still talk to them. You talk to everybody. And look, we are blessed because we have two to three months to report a story at 60 Minutes. We report it twice, really, because we reported once on the phone and in person with a notepad. And then we reported a second time with a television camera and a correspondent. And so uh, we're lucky that way. You put an expert on, and they drone on about something that you could do in a half a line. And they look and sound like Marvin the expert. You know, it just it's kind of turns into noise when you and they're disconnected from the story usually. You know, it's um, you, but you're going to still talk to them and interview them. You're going to still get whatever you can in terms of information to add to the story and make sure that you've covered the ground. By the time you finish producing a 60-minute story, you're so sick of the story because you know so much about it and you can't wait to move on to your next one. But you don't need the expert. And I take them out of stories all the time. Bob Simon and Morley Safer. Oh my gosh. Um, I miss them both so much. Uh, Bob was a shocking death and, and Morley um, you know, is just a tragic, sad loss because he lived a great life. It's not tragic. Um, they, uh, what they did that I they tell people a lot because I always say channel Morley, you know, that's sort of a phrase people are sick of hearing me say, channel Morley. They put things in context, in present day context and historical context. And whenever you saw a Bob Simon piece, or, and they would use the language in a way it was never flowery. They were always very spare. But they would use it in a way to describe, and if you look in the book, some of the examples from Morley, when he's talking about the Finns, you know, dancing the tango, it's just, it takes you away. And it takes you into another world. And that's what Murrow used to preach. You know, find the little thing in a story that will help describe it and, uh, and give you a much better sense of being there yourself. That's one of the things we're lucky enough to be able to do, take people places and show them things. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about audio. Um, you mentioned how 60 Minutes almost you know, validated itself. Uh, by its president, pre presence on the, on the television network. Um, but I remember reading a report by Deloitte in 2016 that said that one in four Americans, roughly, now consumes at least one podcast a month. Yeah. And I know that a lot of, you know, if I'm not mistaken, your content is free via podcast. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit to the process of almost recalibrating to a platform that was originally non-native? Unlike, you know, it may have been for a lot of other outlets. Well, a couple of things. One, we, we've always considered it to be native. It's funny, but if you look in the book, when one of the things Don Hewitt taught us, and he used to close his eyes sometimes in screenings, is your, 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 your story's for the ear, not for the eye. Now, in modern times, with the production as beautiful as it is, I, I, I think it's for the eye as well. But our, our broadcast plays on uh, CBS radio across the country and it plays really well. And I get comments about it a lot because we never want to tell a story that you can't just listen to and follow. Um, in terms of podcast, I, I love the podcast direction. And we're actually talking now about our own. We put 60 Minutes out there for free, but we have a, a, a webcast called uh, Overtime, 60 Minutes Overtime, which is valuable in the sense that people come back from their stories and they come into my office and tell a story that's interesting and sometimes fun sometimes just important. It never makes it into the story because it's more personal. That's what we decided to do with overtime. And they're sort of behind the scenes stories that work really well. Um, we're gonna do that with a podcast, I think, starting in January or February. And they're the easiest things to do. We just sit down and start talking about what the story was. I'll host some of them. You know, it's just one of those uh, brilliant platforms that, yeah, it's taking off. Um, so. I think both things are true, you know, get going on your podcast, which is what we need to, and write for the ear. Yeah. Um, so you touched on it briefly, but how do you actually decide on what stories to pursue, and also how do you decide how much money and time to put into the research for every story? Mm -hmm. you, it's a good question. Each story has an average budget. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a high number. It's a lot of money. We 
give permission when we like a story to, for a reporter to pursue it without any production costs, just their own travel, and, and we'll cut it off early if they come back and say, it not that good? We almost never start shooting and then kill it. Once we've started filming, we go. Uh, because we've discussed it, we know it, we only do 100 stories a year. We go through about 3,000 ideas and give them serious thought. Um, so, most producers, and there's 25 of them, and 25 associate producers that work with each of them, have stories percolating because there's a certain number of stories they're expected to do a year. So they're percolating on what we call the back burner. You know, they just, there's always something they can turn to if something else falls through. Um, and so it's not so much about spending money. Now, when we go to a conflict zone, for example, this Kabul story is going to cost a fortune. And we'll make up for it because the next interview we do at the White House, if the president ever decides he wants to actually do a tough interview, is, is going to be cheap. Does that answer your question? Yes. Kind of going off that a little bit, you talked about how one of the changes you made when you came on was that um, you're trying to make shows that are more timely yeah. and newsy. Um, how does that kind of change the way that 60 Minutes is done? Because I mean, I, I imagine like the shows are so beautiful and yeah. you know well done. Do you have to sacrifice anything to get these more you know timely pieces? No, it's, so I left something out. It's a really good question because we uh, have have gotten really good at predicting where the news can be, and you don't have to be good at it. We, you know, that you know six months from now, immigration is going to be a big story. You know, so we can be working three months on a quality story that's going to feel incredibly relevant come February. Um, the same thing goes, so we're, we're, you know, we're working on a story about the Secretary of Education. Well, that's going to take three or four months, but it's going to feel really timely when it airs. So we never um, sacrifice the reporting time in order to feel current. We just try to be smarter about covering stories that we know are going to be out there. And I, I mentioned the wars. I mean, they're easy. You know, we're going to Kabul. You, we started working on that in, uh, you know, six months ago. The trip is for this week. Uh, but it's going to feel spot on when it airs. And we look at that every single Sunday. So, you know, we're, we're toying this week with not running North Korea and maybe running a story about, uh, from Brazil, which is interesting. And, you know, it's in flux right up until Friday and sometimes till Sunday, which is part of how it feels current as well. What I don't like is what we did too much of in the years before that, is what we call evergreen, stories that you can run any time during the year and they are not, because they're not connected to the news. And that to me got boring. You know, you want, I, I don't care if even if it's a profile, I want the person to be sort of current, sort of there's a reason we're doing this profile. And I don't like doing movie stars. We almost do none anymore. Um, I don't like celebrity stories and we used to do a lot of them because this country has become way too celebrity driven. It's amazing how much there is that uh, involves like Hollywood that's on television. It's crazy and, and they wear me out. You know, I don't want to hear a, a, a Hollywood actor talking about, you know, Sudan. Um, so I think that a reason that a lot of people tune into news recently um, is as a means of being reactive to like large announcements, especially because there's so much shocking policy going on right now. Um, do you find that your method of kind of in-depth storytelling inhibits your ability as a program to respond reactively to important conflict or important policy changes? No, because we can turn it around quickly as well. And we will. And we do. Um, you know, when we do a big interview with a newsmaker like the president, we'll turn it around in three days. But we'll be working on it for months to prepare for the interview. Because by the way, that's one of the hardest things to do. We did the Trump uh, president-elect interview, and that was one of the hardest interviews I, I can imagine. I mean, we, I was exhausted. And we did it, uh, I called Monday, Wednesday morning after the election. I'd been talking to them since May about doing a president-elect interview if he were to win. And we set up a time for Friday at 1. That gave us 48 hours. Now, we had been preparing. 
but still, it was difficult because with the country as divided as it was, you know, how do you go into an interview like that and try to get at all that? It was hard. I was so exhausted that by Tuesday of that week, I remember going home around 5 o'clock to take a nap because we were going out that night. I had to go out that night. I got to lie down for about 10 minutes and it was my phone ringing. It was, it was the president. And he was calling to ask if we broke any records in the ratings. <clears throat> So, um, <clears throat> One thing that we have seen uh, recently in terms of different news organizations, particularly New York Times, Washington Post, is that they're not really going very deep on many issues, um, and there are very few news organizations that are really focusing on any singular issue, rather mm -hmm. just covering an array of different stories and issues. Uh, why are we seeing this sort of decline? I think actually because they're all so busy covering this administration. I think that it's a really good observation, and I just know that all hands are on deck trying to stay up on this story. So if you think about it, they've turned things upside down in a number of places. Some of them probably needed it, but others, you know, are in turmoil. And uh, I know that because we've been working with the Washington Post so closely that They've added reporters to their staff, and they've added investigative reporters, a significant number, which is unheard of in the, in the newspaper business, and that they are all so focused. Now, our opioid story is an example of what you're looking for. And the, in the Washington Post, that was a 10-page uh, takeout, serious investigation. But there's less of it, I think, because um, it seems like there's a story, a big story that's uh, unfolding today, every day. And I think that the resources are stretched thin. Um, I, I, I guess, I mean, I'm guessing. I know what you're talking about. That's the best I can think of in terms of how to answer it. Go. Okay, um, how have you dealt with the press as a target? I know you kind of touched on that, but. The press has always been a target, and we're a really good target. Mm -hmm. I mean, we earn every bit of it. Um, you know, I feel for my friends at CNN because, it's a, you know, he has honed in on them, but at the same time, uh, you know, grin and bear it. You know, it's, we took on this job, we're lucky we have what we have, and they're gonna come after us and blame us, and it's a popular thing to do. Um, I talked about Morley Safer. I remember, you know, look, one of the most powerful moments in, in television was when Morley Safer was covering the war in Vietnam, and he. He, uh, they filmed uh, American soldiers setting huts in a village, in the, the village of Cam Ni on fire. And the Johnson administration was so upset. It was really an important moment in, you know, um, for the, in terms of the war and, and, and its uh, following and why people started to turn against it. And Lyndon Johnson famously said, what is that, morally safe for some kind of communist? And uh, he, the response was, no, sir, actually, he's a Canadian. <laughs> and, and Johnson said, I knew there was something wrong with him. Um, you talk, okay, one thing I've always really admired in 60 Minutes is the candidness. And you talked a lot about, um, like, a need for candidness and real reporting in America. Um, and uh, I run an online magazine, like it's like a club here, and we're very candid. And one question that has come up that made me think about uh, reporting in general is uh, how, okay, how a story is told and who it's told by. And so how do you assert your standard for uh, having journalists reporting on stories and the background of the journalists and them not being too sheltered? Um, and there, you know, sometimes there's a hypocrisy in other, of course not yours, but you know, other, yeah. <laughs> other networks where you know you do just one Google search on the person, they, and you see that it, they're such hypocrites for talking about struggle and stuff like that. So how do you assert your standard for making sure that this person has a great work ethic and understands the complexity of things? Well, I think that. Um what you're saying is a pretty good argument for diversity. You know, and diversity is so important and in any workplace and in a newsroom especially because 
those things matter. The, the sort of biases that are built in that, that you can't do much about, though I think you can spot them as well, sometimes you can't, uh, are important to know about because that, that affects what stories we're going to be doing with that particular person. And that does come into play. So, um, you know, it's not an easy question and it's not an easy determination to make. Uh, but, you know, credibility is what we're all about. And if the credibility is in question, there's no value in the story at all. You talked a bit about the affront that print media has faced because of digital media. And I'm wondering if you could touch a little bit more on the larger effects of, um, or the, the future of large for broadcast media, not specific to 60 Minutes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a scary, proposition looking down the road, just 10 years, I mean, I think maybe even five. Um, cable's in trouble. People are cutting the cord. I mean, uh, uh, so few people in this room probably have cable. I can't imagine almost anybody has it, so that says something. Um, you know, but what a crazy business. I mean, you pay a fortune and you pay for things that you never look at. Um, but, so, at the same time, while I don't see what's, you know, how it's all going to fall out, it's interesting to see that there's so many different uh, splintering now, so many different organizations where you're watching television. So I'm not sure how to separate news, but we are incredibly proud of CBSN, which is our digital news channel. And you, you can only get that on your laptop or your desktop or your mobile device. Man, is it good, though, because you can, you know, I, I found myself on my way to a, a big interview watching a press conference that was going to be important during that interview. Um, that's where it's going. I mean, I think that's where daily news is going for sure. That you're going to be streaming. You're going to, we're going to all be streaming. And I think that uh, it's likely that it's going to be 24 hours. But it's, you know, look, it's still a long way away. CBS Corporation is making a ton of money. What's interesting about it is that a lot of it is coming from advertising still, but the company has shifted to less than 50% advertising. Um, a lot of that money is coming in from digital sources and from retransmission of our programs and from international sales. Uh, you know, it's still incredibly viable and, you know, I do think that, um, you know, for who knows when it's going to start to really turn, but you know, it's not, you notice it every year a little bit chipping away. Um, so I know you mentioned that like uh, you're kind of tired like celebrity stories, um, but you know, like, when you do pursue like, for example, in, in the real to like Beyonce and Taylor Swift, when you do produ uh, produce celebrity stories, um, how do you approach that differently than you would like? Something about you know the president or about like foreign relations. You know, I, it's I like to think that every one of them is every story we do is different, and that there can never be a kind of cookie cutter. So with Taylor Swift, it's how do you write your music? That's interesting. Um, and I think uh, I can't remember when we did her. It was probably five or six years ago. Uh, but I don't like just standard biographies. And I think that's a, also because w what we discussed before, which is when there's so little time, you want to focus on one characteristic or one aspect. Um, we treat, uh, interestingly enough, profiles similar to how we treat uh, obituaries. That, and that sounds crazy, but it's true. We did our obituary about Ronald Reagan when he died and planned it well in advance just to do about how he used humor in his life. Well, that's, you know, a very narrow part of Ronald Reagan, but it sure is informative. And I feel the same way about everything we do. It's got to be, you know, we're evaluating, are we going to do a movie story for January, which we often do in terms of the Oscars? We're evaluating some of the movies right now. What makes them special? Is it special writing? Is it exceptional directing? Is it one role Francis McDormand played? in an upcoming movie. So that's how we'll be careful about, you know, Meryl Streep. We did a story on Meryl Streep. It was, how do you do this so well? Walk us through the process of 
you know, taking on a role. Not where she was born and where she went to college. Merrick. Um, first of all, I should disclose that Claudia does have a sideline business. She's also script supervisor of all my wedding calls. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, but I have my first year journalism students lurking behind me. Yeah. And the beginning of the semester, they're doing a great job now, but some of their interviews on <laughs> subjects and sources, they kind of played stenography. You know, they were always believing what they were saying. Mm -hmm. In 60 minutes, there's that great refrain that we saw, you know, come on. Yeah. Right? So, so I know there's no cookbook formula, but when do you go with come on? Well, you see, that's good. So it actually is so important, and it's one of the things I loved about Ed Bradley. Ed Bradley knew how to listen and shut up. You know, and you know, one thing I, I don't like is when a reporter, and none of ours do this, just go from one question to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. You've got to listen, you've got to be spontaneous, and you've got to follow up. And that's where the come on comes in. You know, come on. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, Ed would talk about the silence. And reporters want to fill the void. You know, you don't have to fill the void. Let them fill it. Let them finish. He did a remarkable story about a young kid who murdered his father. And um, he, the kid was shy, he was quiet, but Ed just didn't say anything. And it all came out. It all came out. And because of that interview, he got pardoned, basically, sent out of jail. So, uh, you know, that's a big part of it, I think, Merrick, is uh, being spontaneous, not sticking to a list ever, knowing your material. If everything, anything our correspondents do, and by the way, they do every single interview. Nobody ever does it for them. They do every, they travel to every interview we do, and they know their subject, they know the material, so much so that they don't need to go based on a list or a note. And then at the end of it, they can ask us behind them, what did I leave out? Well, we did President Obama, I'll never forget it, with the, uh, Steve Croft did a great job when he was president-elect with, with Michelle. And we got to the end, it was gonna be the whole hour of the interview, and, and he looked back and said, did I leave anything out? I said, yeah, you didn't ask him about being the first African-American. <laughs> president. And the answer was incredible. But we're always there to back you up, and they know it. We're always there to make sure that something important doesn't get left out. Um, you don't have producers on your stories with you, but but don't be afraid to leave anything out. You can always write into your narration to your, to your story what you've left out. Hi. Um, so, I think it's safe to say that journalists are under attack right now. Yes. And I was just wondering if you could speak a little on what, like, because one of the big accusations that, that, that justifies, like, so much criticism on journalism is that there is, like, a liberal bias, um, but I was wondering if your program does anything to make content more palatable for people of all like party affiliations, or whether it's just yeah, that's about fairness, and I think we do that. We don't hear a lot of criticism about being biased. We'll get a series of notes from like, every Monday morning from people who say both things. You know, you 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 were too left on this, you were too right on this, but we we don't hear a lot of that, and it's because we. Work so hard. You know, one of the things I talk about a lot is if someone won't cooperate with your reporting, it doesn't mean you, you have to represent their side of the story as best you can. And so I think that if you build a reputation of being fair, we're always going to hear criticism, but we ain't left and we ain't right. And um, we work hard on that. And, but you're right. People, journalism is under attack right now. And as I've said, it goes through phases where we're under more attack than not. And this is one of those phases. And he gets the president a lot of mileage from attacking the press. It works. It works for him. It works for them. And we just have to be tough enough to take it. And to stay fair. Because, by the way, some of what he's complaining about might be true. Maybe some of those outlets are going too far, just spending time looking for bad and not some good. Hi, my name is Megan. I'm a senior Hi. here. Um, 
Uh, my question is actually uh, related to Merrick's. So as you've said, 60 Minutes is a program that gets the truth even when interviewees don't want to share it, um, like related to the commons. Um, how, uh, with this in mind, how do your 60 Minute reporters get people to reveal the truth? And um, also to the second part, with people and companies knowing how intrusive uh, your interviews are, why do you think they keep coming back? So they, they do say no a lot. Um, when they say yes, they are evaluating risk versus reward. Everybody knows it's going to be a tough interview. You know, everybody knows that there isn't going to be, there more than, better than tough, probably the word direct. Um, everybody knows that, you know, we're going to ask whatever we want. And so when someone says, well, I'll do the interview, but I'm not going to talk about this, we don't go for that. The only thing we promise is fairness and a uh, big audience. And, you know, look, I've been surprised that uh, Mark Zuckerberg hasn't done an interview with us considering how important Facebook is right now and how much it's in the news, but he hasn't. Doesn't want to do it. Somehow that's too risky, I guess. So I do think they evaluate risk versus reward, but if someone says no, that's fine, we move on to the next story. Or, if we think the story is important enough, we'll do it anyway, with or without their cooperation. Thank you. Working up over the last 50 years, is there anything you wish you guys had done differently? Yeah. So many things. We made mistakes. Um, it's hard to avoid. Uh, I think we've kept them to a minimum. Uh, so many things. I mean, I, 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 I can never understand when someone says they don't have regrets. I mean, I have so many, you know, I'm a happy guy, but I, uh, you know, I, I'd like to take a few things back. Um, you know, uh, we did a story about Benghazi that was flawed because it was, uh, the cornerstone of it was a guy who was lying to us. Um, and, you know, proper vetting should at some point turn that up, and it didn't. Um, 60 Minutes 2, not connected to us at the time. Uh, after I left, thank God, did a story about George W. Bush and uh, uh, documents that apparently showed him sloughing off at, at, in the National Guard. The documents were questionable, and that was a big flaw. Our corporation kept us from running a story about tobacco. That was the biggest story probably we ever broke, except Abu Ghraib, which I did oversee, and. Uh, that's a source of great pride for us, even though what we reported was pretty difficult to take. So, uh, yeah, I think it's like a lot of things. You know, it's funny, in, in our last interview with President Obama, I just loved his answer to that question. We were trying to pin him down on something that I think was a real flaw in his administration, which was the red line he drew over uh, Syria using chemical weapons and not, and then when they crossed it, he didn't attack. And now there's a lot of complications involved in that, but I, you can talk to any general, no matter what their stripes, I don't care which candidate they're for, they would say that was a big mistake, probably his biggest. And his answer to that was, you know what, um, here's why I don't, I, I, I think I did the right thing at the moment, but guess what, there isn't a day goes by that I wouldn't like to take something back and have it over again. A line that I used in this interview with you right here, I know later on I'm going to say, damn it, why didn't I say this? And I just thought that was so revealing. I feel the same way. I make uh, so many decisions in a day. And, uh, you know, I think we have a pretty good track record, but they're not all perfect. Um, what has been your favorite story or the one that most has, like, has stayed with you um, that you've worked on? Uh, you know, I get asked about this a lot, and I said in the book at the time, because I have different favorites depending on the time. Right now, as you can tell, it's the opioid story. But uh, I think in recent years, it was uh, the story we did about um, Duke um, Brain Cancer Center. Uh, they're using the polio virus uh, to uh, fight glioblastoma, the worst brain cancer there is. Uh, where there's no cure, and my father was a brain surgeon, so I knew, grew up with this. Uh, he didn't even operate on them. And to this day, if you operate, it might extend life by a couple of months. They're finding by dropping 
This is immun immunotherapy, and you read about it on every front. It's very exciting by putting drops of the polio virus directly onto the brain where the cancer is. It, it all of a sudden awakes the immune system, and it starts fighting off the polio and killing the cancer in the process. It's unbelievable. That, to me, is one of those stories where, wow, you know, it's like life on Mars, <laughs> you know, a cure for cancer. It's not a cure yet, but boy, is it promising. And that really, I think, is, if you ask me what's my favorite, that was incredibly fulfilling. One more. Um, so Sorry, one more. To us college students with things like fake news that you spoke about, besides uh, 60 Minutes and CBSN, would you recommend any other resources to like stay up to date with current uh, issues? Yeah, I, I think The New Yorker is amazing. Um, it's just great journalism. I think Frontline on television. Um, yeah, it, as I said, it's not us because it's not commercial, but it sure competes with us in terms of storytelling and 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 covering real important stories, and doing it so well. Um, the New Yorker is really, uh, I think, the best publication of its kind, not even close. But look, I, I, you know, you hear people criticize the New York Times. Is there a better newspaper in the world? I don't think so. I love the Wall Street Journal, and I love the Washington Post. Yeah, um, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but can you go more in depth as to why um, President Trump has been declining an offer for an interview? And can you also give us a little bit of sneak peek into any um, stories you're excited about coming in there? <laughs> to, to an extent, I will, yeah. It's a good question. Um, you know, we never, I've, I've, I'm the one who talks to the White House about interviews. We, um, we haven't done an interview with him since he's been president, and there were three occasions in the past nine months where I, has it been nine months? It's eight months, whatever, that I thought we were gonna get it, but we didn't, and, and, and we had never set a date. Is he avoiding us? Uh, maybe. Is he, is he waiting for something of an accomplishment to talk about before he does an interview with people like us. I think, I think actually maybe, because I think, you know, maybe something happens uh, after they get some kind of tax reform done in the next two or three weeks. Um, look, we go about our job. We do our reporting. We, I think an interview with the president on 60 Minutes is an important part of America because our system doesn't challenge a president. He can avoid any serious questions. It's not like parliament where you have to go before your peers and you know, take them on once a week in question time. You know, we don't have that. The president can skate by without doing a press conference. You, know. you talk about uh, press conferences, I mean, or you know, look at Hillary Clinton. She went through eight months of her campaign without doing a serious interview. And she was avoiding it. And that was a mistake. And she avoided us. And she got so mad at us that she wouldn't do an interview with Scott Pelley anymore. And that, I think, hurt her because the broadcast that I had planned for her to do an interview with Scott Pelley was late September in front of 20 million people. And just about the issues. It's the only promise I made. No cheap, no nothing, just issues. Tell us where you stand. And we had done that in two previous elections. So the politicians um, can avoid us pretty easily. And so, you know, in, in government positions are out. And um, I honestly don't think he is avoiding us. I think he's waiting for the right moment to do an interview with us. <clears throat> and there's a lot to talk about. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Thanks. <laughs>